Um, I'm very happy to introduce our friend, Kari Germanson Martin. I'm sorry, I'll always remember Germans, you by Germanson. <laughs> no offense, Joe. Um, and uh, Kari graduated 25 years ago from Alfred with a double major in environmental studies and political science. Uh, great, great combination of majors, by the way. And um, she went on to get a master's degree from the School of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse. And she has been working for Clean Ocean Action or other related type of groups, um, but mostly Clean Ocean Action, I think, um, since then. And I'm gonna turn it over to her. She can tell you more about what she does and what she's been doing. Thanks, Kari. Thank you. And welcome to her husband and, and kids. <laughs> Thank you. Try to clip this on here. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Sorry. Um, it's been a whirlwind of a week for me um, traveling up here. Um, my name is Kari Germison Martin. Um, as Michelle said, I, you know, Alfred is near and dear to my heart. Um, it's actually in the family for me. Um, so uh, my mom went here and my sister, older sister went here and I went here. Um, and I brought my family here to um, enjoy a fall weekend in upstate New York. So great job on getting the colors out here um, for us um, in full force. So my husband, Joe, and my daughter and son, um, Astri and Derry. Uh, so we're very glad to be here. I'm glad to be here for, um, you know, learning more about Alfred and how it's changed, but also be able to be on the other side of um, the room uh, from where I was here as a student, as a presenter to all of you. So uh, thanks so much for coming out today. Um, I'm just going to give you uh, a little bit about me and about my presentation before I uh, move along so you get an idea of what you'll be hearing about today. Um, and hello to those on the, in the Zoom world. Thanks so much for joining us um, today. They are we. <laughs> Great. Let's see. Go back to the not advancing. Hold on one second. Here we go. Uh, so just to give you an overview, um, so this is the mighty Atlantic Ocean right off the coast of New Jersey. A lot of people, when they see this picture, they can't believe that it's actually New Jersey waters, but yes, it is blue and green and clear on uh, many days. Um, and this was taken this summer when we had excellent water quality. Um, but just as an introduction, um, I'll talk to you about um, my presentation. Um, and that is, uh, we've talking about plastic pollution and the plague it has on our environment on the impacts it has, uh, why we have plastics and the plastic pollution problem, talk about actions and solutions that are, have been done, are in place, or are getting done, um, and then things that need to get done to address the problem of plastics here um, in our environment and communities. Uh, as an introduction again, uh, so I came here at, at Alfred and uh, got my Bachelor of Arts degree in 1997 in environmental science, uh, environmental studies and political science. So I uh, found uh, my inspiration from thankfully some professors I had here and I'm glad to see um, Dr. Rasmussen's daughter here in the audience. So he was an inspiration for me as well as um, uh, Dr. Lukey. And uh, I carried on my uh, desire to learn about the environment through college. Um, and then added the political science uh, to complement that and an interest in how things get done and how laws get made um, and how people power can help do that. Um, and I decided to move on to get my master's degree from the SUNY College of Environment, Environmental Science and Forestry or ESF in Syracuse. So I stayed up here in the snow belt area, um, even though I grew up in New Jersey um, where we get a little bit of snow, but um, I survived and I lived to tell a tale and share it with everybody else how, what a wonderful state New York is and how gorgeous, especially this time of year. Uh, after, after graduate school, um, actually during graduate school, I did an internship, which is so important when you're in, in college um, or even before that uh, to experience um, some things you might want to uh, learn and um, possible job opportunities. Um, I have to find Clean Ocean Action uh, through the early days of Google search. Um, and uh, I'm, I probably had heard about them um, living at the shore and growing up at the shore um, my whole life. Um, but I learned more about them and uh, had an internship with them um, one summer, which turned into my master's thesis work. Uh, so it was valuable to learn about nonprofit organizations and what their place is in making change in our environment and in our communities. 
um, and just raising awareness about, um, about issues. Uh, so after graduate school, I did find a full-time job at Clean Ocean Action. I, was, uh, I started uh, doing outreach and education work, um, talking to people and students of all ages about ocean pollution issues, um, and then dove a little bit more into the uh, communications and policy aspects um, before having a family um, and raising two ocean advocates of my own, our own, and um, then rejoined the organization just uh, three years ago um, in policy um, and advocacy, um, because that is kind of what my interest lies, as I said earlier, getting people involved in doing things and doing, uh, making good change. So Clean Ocean Action, um, our mission uh, is to improve the degraded water quality of the marine waters off New York, New Jersey coast. We were established in 1984 as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, while we had an office for 36 years, I believe, in um, a Gateway Rec National Recreation Area at Sandy Hook, the national park, um, for that many years, we moved recently just before the, the pandemic time to Long Branch. This is right down the coast, um, on the northern coast of New Jersey. Uh, we are a coalition of organizations uh, to stop ocean pollution. Very simple. We find a source of ocean pollution. We work with citizen action, education, research, and policies to make sure it gets cleaned up and we get the ocean cleaner um, than it has been and we improve those waters for not only the thousands and millions of critters that live in the ocean but for the people uh, that enjoy it every day um, and the uh, clean ocean economies that depend on a clean ocean. So we're a small organization of um, usually around eight to ten employees. We've got summer internships so if you are interested please check us out on our website. Um, we usually advertise them in early spring so we can get some um, great inspiring uh, college students to do some, some really good work and we do put you to work. I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about um, the ecological richness and diversity that we have right off the coast of New York, New Jersey. Uh, we've got wonderful, wonderful um, animals that people are surprised to hear about. I mean, even people that live in New Jersey don't even know that we have spe uh, five species of sea turtles and four species of seals um, and all these wonderful um, animals right off our coast that depend on clean waters to live and to forage and to thrive. Um, we've got 27 species of whales and dolphins um, and they are amazing. And only in recent years, has uh, have people really understood or, and seen those whales um, uh, jumping right off the coast. We were very fortunate to see them uh, last year um, right off the, the beach that we go to. So it was, it's really a sight to see and a reminder of what really is out there and why it's important to make sure we're keeping these waters and our coastal areas and, and our environment in general clean. So at the same time that we have all this diversity and richness, it is also downstream of millions of people. Um, this is uh, an aerial photo of New York City and, and northern New, Jer northern New Jersey. Um, we have the major rivers that go, go past these area that come and drain from northern New Jersey, um, very urbanized area. Uh, so pretty much uh, anything that is dumped on the ground, thrown on the ground and washed um, into our waterways by way of rain and snow, um, or illegal dumping will find its way into the ocean, the ocean being the ultimate sink to all of our rivers and waterways. So when you have all, this, all these people in this small amount of area, there's a lot of congestion, there's a lot of litter and other signs of, um, of millions of people in one area. So at the same time, today I'm gonna focus uh, my discussion to you about one visible sign of pollution. Of course, there's a lot of different types of pollution. There's bacteria, there's viruses, there's uh, all different types of um, chemicals that you can't see that are plaguing our ocean waters, our rivers, our streams, our lakes, and our communities. But today I'll be talking to you mainly about um, one very visible source of pollution or sign of pollution is our plastics. And it really is a plague uh, nationwide and globally and locally. So we have a picture here um, from Indonesia. Those are, there. if you could see up close, you do have a big screen here. Um, those are, um, plastic bottles and other garbage in a waterway that is actually water that they're, you know, floating on. Um, so we also have uh, from across the globe to local creeks, streams, and rivers. Uh, this is the Delaware River. Uh, so while Clean Ocean Action focuses a lot of uh, work on ocean pollution issues, 
Um, we do know the Delaware River is a big source of water into our ocean. So we've been doing a little bit of research of litter upstream uh, to comp uh, compare with the data that we have on the ocean side. So then to the ocean, this all goes, um, if not taken out of the air, uh, out of those river and waterways, uh, about 8 million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean each year, which is about a garbage truck full of plastic every 45 seconds. Um, it's an enormous amount of garbage uh, that goes unchecked and into the ocean. 90% uh, of the plastic is from land-based sources. So that's people on land, uh, production, manufacturing, other activities on land. Yet with all of this happening and being seen on the beaches, these are pictures from um, the ocean beach pictures from New Jersey um, during a garbage wash up event, uh, which happens um, occasionally when we have the right, the east winds and a storm um, and um, perhaps heavy rains that bring that uh, debris into our rivers and, and the ocean. With all of this still plaguing our waterways, we still have seen plastic production increase 230 fold since 1950 and half of all the plastic ever made was made just since 2005. US is the largest producer of plastic waste and most of the waste, 90% of it becomes, uh, uh, most of the plastic uh, becomes garbage within one year. So that means that we're talking about things that are used once, twice for convenience. 42% of the pr plastic being produced is for packaging. So everything that we, by at the store, whether it's paper towels to, um, you know, our, our fruits and vegetables sometimes are wrapped in plastic. Um, that is, it's mainly for packaging. Yet with all of this plastic, only 9% has been recycled and it's only 5% in the United States. So we have all of this in our waste stream and not getting to the recycling center or not being recycled. So it's an enormous amount and it's, created a plague of pollution on our, on our resources. So why plastics? Well, think about the plastic items you've seen in your day, uh, throughout your day from breakfast to dinner, snacks in between. They're versatile, plastics are made to be, or found to be versatile, lightweight, but they're strong. So they're strong enough to hold, uh, if you think of the plastic shopping bags, they're strong enough to hold um, you know, piles of groceries, um, but also long lasting. They can last few uses um, or, or maybe one, one, one breaks along the way, um, but it is convenient. And it's mainly a lot of the plastics made for single use. Um, so however, we have, to we have to remind ourselves that plastics do not break down um, or go away. There is no away. Um, really it's, they break down into smaller and smaller pieces through photodegradation, which is through, through uh, sunlight and the conditions um, in the environment um, into smaller and smaller pieces called microplastics and nanoplastics. So those are minuscule pieces of plastic as seen on the penny, uh, which is obviously um, zoomed in, but also in the Petri dish, you could see the different types of fibers and, plastic, uh, and pieces of plastic that are all plastics. Um, and the cartoon in the middle there, what's for breakfast? Um, um, those are neurals. Uh, so these are little worms. So they are looking at little tiny pieces of plastic that are called nurdles. They're the building blocks of all the plastic um, items that we use. It's what the, is the raw material for, for, build, for making other plastic um, uh, products. So in all, um, I'm so sorry about the nurdles. Um, you could probably, if you go to a beach, you could go right along the water's edge um, particularly, and you could scoop up, get a handful of sand. And a lot of times you might think that's all little pebbles. There are nurdles in there. There's lots of nurdles. You could tell they have little seams on them. It's a little tiny piece of plastic. So it's not a rock, um, but it's uh, tiny little nurdles, um, which are often dumped there or overboard by um, uh, containers, ships carrying them, um, and also through the manufacturing process and waste, wastewater, um, wastewater releases. So in all, plastics have a large carbon footprint um, over the whole life cycle of the product, whether it's um, because it's being extracted uh, as a petroleum uh, and a fossil fuel to the production and manufacturing, um, and all the way to the end life of it um, being disposal, whether it's recycling or, um, uh, dis or in the environment. Now I'm just gonna go over a little bit about the impacts of plastics. 
Um, there's some uh, various pictures here um, of some of the signs and the impacts of plastics. So we have um, anything from what you probably already have been hopefully educated about the impacts on wildlife um, in terms of ingestion um, and, and um, entanglement from plastic items. Um, we've got beach closures, hence the, the photo of the, the flags, no swimming, uh, garbage wash up, um, sometimes medical waste being um, mixed in um, through way of the syringes and things that are discarded in streets that wash into storm drains. Or um, in the case of our urban areas, there's something called combined sewer overflows. Um, and combined sewer overflows are um, years and years ago when the uh, wastewater infrastructure uh, was created and built in these uh, communities and cities like New York City and Newark and the large cities um, by the coast. They had one pipe for the wastewater from their houses and their businesses um, and um, also for capturing rainwater uh, to make sure there's no flooding on our roads. And that one pipe goes to a wastewater treatment plant that can accept a certain amount, a certain number of gallons um, of uh, wastewater or uh, sewage or um, rainwater. And when it rains um, a short, a small amount, um, a tenth or a half, an, a quarter of an inch or more, uh, the wastewater treatment center uh, can take, takes it, what it can to do the processing of it and then closes the gates and the rest of the wastewater, the combined sewage and rainwater and stormwater goes directly into the near, nearest waterway. So that being the Hackensack River, Passaic River, East River, Hudson River, Delaware River. So there's um, anything that's untreated. So whatever gets flushed down the toilets, whatever gets down um, uh, drained in the bathtub, shower, sinks, um, will go untreated into our waterways. So that's why we will find signs of raw sewage um, in our, in our um, on um, beaches when we have garbage wash ups um, and such and things like syringes that sometimes are flushed down the toilet but also tossed on the streets. So we have street litter and filth as well as signs of raw sewage um, getting into our waterways and onto our beaches. Um, and then the other side of plastics is also public health. Um, the other impacts, public health being the air pollution and the water pollution um, from the whole life cycle of making plastics um, and the impacts on people living in the communities around the facilities that is producing the plastic and manufacturing it as well as recycling it. And uh, there's a photo here of um, a member of Rise St. James, uh, Sharon Levine. She's um, an activist in Louisiana in an area commonly known as Cancer Alley uh, because there's a number of uh, facilities that are plastic producers and manufacturers um, and petrochemical facilities that are cited there um, in communities, um, mainly a lot of communities of color and diversity. So she is there um, making sure uh, business uh, companies are held accountable for the damage they're doing, not only to the environment, but to public health and uh, the communities that are surrounding these facilities that are creating all this waste. So that's the environmental justice and equity part of plastics production. So just to go over more, a little more specifically, uh, plastic litter is harmful and lethal uh, by way of ingestion. The animals eating the, the, the plastic, thinking it, it looks like food um, and also entanglement. So here we have some photos. Um, most, the most recent photo I have is the, the Canada goose that has a six pack beverage ring around its um, mouth. So that was taken um, in New Jersey and Bayshore to water, Waterfront Park on the northern coast of Bayshore. Uh, we were not able to go over and try to help it. It, it flew away before we were able to. Um, but it's, it's something that is a problem. I know there's been many education campaigns over the years. I remember, you know, saying people should clip them before throwing them out. But, um, you know, that is helpful, but it's still plastics in the environment. Uh, so uh, scientists es and research estimates that by 2050, 90% of all seabirds will have ingested plastics of some kind. Um, that could be as small as the tiny pieces or as big as a bottle cap um, from, from a water bottle. Um, it is estimated that 22% of the fatalities of dolphins and whales can be attributed to plastics. Um, when you think of whales and how they feed and um, they just open their mouths and, and get a whole bunch of fish at one time, um, there could be plastics uh, within whatever they eat or plastics you know floating in the water where they where they're feeding um, so if you all you have to do is 
to get a little depressed is to Google and YouTube um, search some videos of necropsies for animals um, that um, you know, studies that have been done um, on to find out what was the cause of death for the animals. And you'll see that there have been pounds of plastic found in whale stomachs and digestive systems and with turtles. Um, so it's really a, a, a pervasive, horrible problem. Um, and along the lines of um, those plastics just getting ingested, filling up the stomachs um, are also the, the, the chemicals and the resins and things that are, and colorants that are in the plastics as well. Those are chemicals um, that are now into the environment and now in the systems of these animals. Um, the picture, it's probably hard to see on the bot, your bottom left, um, that's an actual uh, dead carcass of a albatross. Um, as you can see, there's plastics inside um, the belly area um, and also mixed in with some garbage as well. Um, so by 2025, with all those plastics out there, there's, it's estimated that for every three pounds of fish in the ocean, there will be one pound of plastics. And if you think about the amount of fish in the ocean, that's a lot of plastics. Um, and then according to research, and of course, I think this, this number would be higher, um, then documented 663 species of um, animals have been affected, impacted by um, plastic pollution. And as I said, the toxins and pollutants um, that are along with those um, are now in the, uh, the digestive, digestive systems in the environment. So it's a serious problem um, and one that we um, are trying to educate people about um, because of the disposal of the plastics. Yes, they should be put in the garbage. Yes, they should be recycled, but how about reducing the amount of plastics that we're creating and using um, so we have less to take care of and, and, and to find places for. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, so I did mention a little while ago that um, plastics are the type of trash, trash that lasts. Um, this is a, a marine debris biodegradation timeline that shows how many years it takes for items to break down over time in the marine environment obviously under certain conditions and the condition of the actual item itself when it gets into the system. Um, but we have, you know, plastics and things that last for hundreds of years. Um, the more natural things, you know, obviously a little, um, a little shorter time frame. depends on the size of the item, depends on, you know, what's, you know, anything that gets out there in the environment, something will attach to it. Um, you know, a lot of um, species, you know, find things to attach to and um, in the case that Clean Ocean Action has had beach cleanups and also underwater cleanups that a lot of the times it was hard to take the trash out of the, the bed of the riverbed because there was so many things living in it um, and making use of um, uh, the item. Uh, but some of people don't actually think about some of the things as plastic. I have two pictures here. Um, one is of uh, cigarette butt filters. A lot of people think they're made of natural fibers. It looks cottony if you open it up, but it's actually made of small plastic fibers that are made to uh, filter some of the toxins out of um, the product as it's smoked and consumed. So the plastic fibers actually are harmful because it not only has the toxics in them and the chemicals, but also because of the ingestion hazard. Um, these look like little pieces of fish, little fish to birds and other marine life. Um, there is a fascinating photo that someone got at, um, in Florida. She had a long range uh, zoom camera and found a, um, a tern uh, feeding its young a cigarette butt. Uh, just picked right off of the beach thinking, you know, they're feeding its young and it was a cigarette filter. Um, and it's um, a picture that is lasting in my brain because it's all human cause. Like, cigarette butts are not natural, they're man-made and therefore the problem is, is man-made and the solutions can also be uh, from, from all of us. And also a lot of people don't think of plastics um, as uh, balloons as plastic. So this is a photo from Island Beach State Park in New Jersey um, that was shared by us by a family, this family that found this whole bouquet, if you will, or train of garland of uh, balloons um, in the ocean. And when we have an east wind, a lot of times, you know, that stuff is floating in, uh, but with balloons, it is a type of plastic. Um, and a type of harmful plastic. When you release balloons or accidentally or on purpose, a lot of events and, and, and things have, and organizations have balloon releases. What goes up must come down. So it goes up in the air and everybody takes pictures and thinks it's all great, but it does come down at some point, whether it's not right next to you, the wind carries it. Um, and also it bursts once it gets up to a certain level and then it comes down in pieces, 
with the string and all um, down to our beaches in our communities, our waterways. Um, and if you think of, I usually have props, but as I was traveling, I didn't bring them all. If you think of a balloon floating on top of the ocean, what do you think it looks like? Uh, what kind of animal food source would it, would it look like? Yes, thank you, a jellyfish. A jellyfish, which is a, for, a, is a primary source of, of food for turtles. So turtles can come up and they see this. It looks, especially with the strings attached, it looks like a jellyfish um, and uh, turtles mistake it for food. Um, so I know my kids knew that answer. So um, thank you. Uh, so it's, it's a, it looks like food to animals. It's mistaken for food and then it's ingested. And then you have animals that have um, balloons, whether inflated or not, are harmful. They're in their digestive systems, filling their stomachs up, not allowing them to get the food that they need and then the right nutrition for them to thrive. Um, so we are um, working on solutions. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a few moments, but it's just something I like to tell people because they don't think of balloons as plastic, um, but it is a type of plastic. And with mylar balloons, which are those shiny ones, uh, they can actually also cause fires as they get entangled in power lines. Um, and they uh, can uh, harm linemen that have to go up there and fix, and they cause power outages. Um, so it's a concern not only for wildlife, but also for everybody that um, needs and, and, and needs power and, and, uh, and for safety. So I alluded to this a little earlier, um, is uh, plastics are actually made from fossil fuels, as we know, mostly natural gas and the production of natural gas and the off production of natural gas through the facilities. Um, and through the production um, of plastic, uh, the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted from just the production is the same as 116 average sized coal fired power plants. Uh, so we've obviously been doing a lot of work to reduce the impacts of climate change um, and to address sources of greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. So we've heard a lot about taking coal fire pyro plants offline um, and making sure that we're um, being efficient and reducing fossil fuels, getting electric cars, electrifying uh, things, but we are still feeding the desire to make more plastic. And that is also causing greenhouse gases that are causing a lot of the problems with, with climate change. And I will say that the, uh, the companies that have, uh, that have traditionally been the fossil fuel companies are now turning to plastics as their new product of choice to continue their success and their profits and to continue the work of their companies using fossil fuels to make into new products. Um, and we're finding microplastics in soil, in precipitation. It's literally raining plastics on us. Um, it's also um, found in air, dusty winds, and water. Um, I do remember one of my projects here um, in, in uh, Alfred, and I forgot which class it was. I guess it was, um, it probably reminded me, Michelle, but um, I did collect rainwater from different parts of um, the area. I did collect rainwater from Alfred and I collected rainwater from New Jersey to a couple different places in New Jersey to compare what was in it. And I think it was a a chromatograph, gas chromatograph. So I learned new things by learning the tools, but um, I never really thought until I started working for Clean Ocean Action and seeing the research about the plastics in rain. Um, that's something that you know is eye-opening to me that literally it's raining on plastic on us. Um, and in doing so, it is affecting uh, the actual processes of the natural environment. There's research being done and suggesting that the plastics that are in that upper layer of the ocean um, just floating there like tiny plastics is interrupting the ocean's ability to moderate climate change. And it's naturally done so over the years. It's, it's, it's absorbing the carbon and heat. Um, so if you have something that's interrupting that uh, through the whole process of the ocean, that could mean some huge changes for not only atmosphere and our way of life, but also for the ocean as well. So plastics in some, are, there's impacts on on wildlife, there's impacts on uh, public health through the air and, and water um, and land pollution, as well as um, climate change. So the public health impacts, um, there are you know, the hidden costs of the pl plastic planning. Uh, there was a, a recent report from a number of organizations releasing information about what hazardous chemical uh, uh, families that are in the plastics, heavy metals, flame retardants, phthalates, biphenols, and fluorinated uh, compounds 
that are from the plastics production um, process that's causing um, impacts. Microplastics are found in the food web. So my title of my presentation was You Are What You Eat because we're literally eating plastic. Humans ingest up to one credit card worth of plastic every week, every week in the food that we're eating, whether it's the fish that have it in their tissues, um, it's just minuscule, uh, but it adds up and we are not sure, you know, we're, there's research being done as to what are the impacts of having this, in, this plastics into our bodies. Um, and of course the air and water pollution from the emissions from facilities um, are causing havoc on our public health. So just to give you an idea, and uh, this is after lunch or before your lunch, depending on how your day went, um, that there have been microplastics found in tea, uh, sea salt, seaweed, milk, seafood, honey, sugar, beer, vegetables, and soft drinks, pretty much what we all eat every day. Um, so it's really concerning that what we have created is getting into, um, into our foods and into the, uh, the things that we need to survive as well as the, the environment. So I just wanna go over some of the um, actions and solutions that we are, um, that Clean Ocean Action is involved in and um, many other of our colleagues. Um, as I said, we're a coalition of organizations. So we have um, religious organizations, women's groups, environmental groups, surfing groups, businesses, um, all involved over the years of um, coming up with solutions to these sources of pollution. I failed to mention in the beginning with Clean Ocean Action, we started, um, the organization was started by our current executive director, Cindy Ziff, um, who still leads us all in finding sources of pollution, finding the solutions and getting people engaged in ways to make sure our ocean is better off um, and improved. Um, so we do that through citizen action, education and research. Um, and we, when Clean Ocean Action started in 1984, there were eight ocean dump sites, legally legal dump sites off the New York and New Jersey coast from acid waste being dumped there, contaminated mud from the harbors in, uh, needed for shipping and, and navigation. Um, there was also um, wood burning that was placed out there, dumped out there. Um, and everybody remembers the, the garbage barge um, issues if you do a little Googling and, and research back. So we, there was eight ocean dump sites and through the work of Clean Ocean Action and elected officials that heard the citizens and the thousands of citizens that found out about these sources of pollution, found out about the impacts to our, our ocean, uh, took action and convinced um, them to end ocean dumping. In the year 2000, we were able to say we were dump site free. Uh, I forgot the other one, sewage sludge was being dumped out there. Uh, so it was, it's really a testament to the amount of people power that can um, make changes. So some of the actions and solutions related to plastics, um, we, Clean Ocean Action has been doing our own uh, research and community science for 37 years. Um, our beach sweeps, which um, I'll talk to you a little bit about later, but it's gathering data on the debris that we're finding on our beaches, how much of it, from where, possibly where, um, and um, what we could do about it. Uh, but also learning about um, microplastics. This photo here under the research is um, one of our uh, interns that was doing microplastics counting and research. So she's got a little our little square there looking at microplastics within that sample area um, and, and documenting the sources and documenting the amount of uh, microplastics. Um, we also do water testing at local rivers um, and streams uh, related to bacterial pollution, uh, but obviously keeping in mind to seeing what kind of plastics are out there as well. We do education and awareness and there's a lot of groups. We work a lot with our colleagues throughout the state, uh, but we have our own education and awareness programs uh, to target um, to target specific people, to educate them about um, their individual behaviors and how it impacts um, our marine life and the ocean in terms of what they're littering and what they're disposing of and how are they recycling and what are they purchasing and what are they reusing. Um, but also we do cleanups, as I said, twice a year uh, to get people on the feet, uh, on the sand, um, to um, pick up garbage and to, to be citizen scientists. At the same time, uh, we also work to get state and local laws um, in place to address these sources of pollution. Um, as you may know, so I assume many of you are from New York. I know that um, many of you may not be, uh, but there are a number of states that have passed statewide laws um, banning plastic. I'll talk to you about uh, New Jersey's in a bit, but I know that New York has a, a bag ban as well uh, for plastic bags. 
Um, and then there's over 350 cities in the United States that actually passed uh, ordinances uh, to, to ban plastics of some kind, whether it's a bag or straws. Um, so it really began from the ground up from the local level, then to the state level. Um, and New Jersey passed ours in 2020, and uh, we're working on the Im implementation of that. But of course, there's federal laws that we also need to um, uh, have in place. Uh, there's a new one or a recent one, Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, that's not passed yet. Um, I guess I should put bill instead of act, sorry. Um, but it's um, to, to address plastic pollution at a nationwide level. And of course, international, we only dive into that a little bit um, when uh, we have uh, at Clean Ocean Action, when we are asked about the global um, impacts, uh, since all the oceans are connected, um, and we are connected through those oceans and, and its cleanliness. So there's a current global plastics treaty that's being discussed among nations to address plastics crisis at the, um, at the global level. So just, um, I know that New York has its own law, but, um, and I think you, def you definitely were first for us. And I know there were some hiccups in, in implementation and enforcement that delayed the law in New York for a bit um, during the pandemic. Uh, but New Jersey um, has its own law to address uh, plastic pollution, and we're right in the right in the middle of it. Uh, and Clean Ocean Action had worked with our environmental colleagues to get a law passed. It took probably about ten years in all, in various iterations of um, laws that were proposed or vetoed. Um, a lot of different scenarios, trying to plan for every situation to make sure that our plastic is not getting out there. Uh, so New Jersey's law was passed and it's the best, the, the most, the strongest in the nation because we not only uh, have a bag ban on plas a plastic bags. So for carry-out bags, when you go to stores and restaurants, they cannot provide you with a plastic carry-out bag. But we went beyond and uh, the actual law prohibits giving out paper bags at stores over 2,500 square feet. So that's your Wegmans, that's your, we have Wegmans in New Jersey. Um, we, that's your shop rights, all the large stores. So this really puts um, people in the position of bringing reusable bags. Um, and that's the promotion that we would like to, uh, to um, show to people uh, through this law. It was effective on May 4th, we're five months in. Um, there have been, I was just at the State House of Trent and, in New Jersey yesterday, Trenton testifying because there is an attempt to exempt, um, oh, sorry, an attempt to extend um, the um, grocery, actually repeal the grocery bag, paper bag provision for delivery of groceries, because that's something that was not planned during the writing of this law, because we didn't have the pandemic. There was not a lot of grocery or online orders and delivery, but now there's a quite a bit more um, and people, a small percentage of people are complaining they have too many reusable bags um, because we do not have a take back program for that in place yet. But there are some really innovative solutions that are out there um, that are have, have kiosks that you can get your bags at the store and, and buy them, uh, rent them for one, one small fee and then return them. Uh, so the innovation is there, it's going to be coming. There's going to be um, some great solutions out there but at, the very, at this very moment, there is complaints about reusable, too many reusable bags out there. So one of the solutions that we are promoting and that uh, the state is as well is to donate those bags to food banks and food pantries that are also under the law. So they can't hand out plastic bags. And, and, um, and also New York state, I think your bag ban, restaurants can give out plate, plastic bags. Is that correct? And take out New Jersey, you cannot. So um, we've worked a lot with um, some of our colleagues in New York to learn from other states and some of the things that we can um, strengthen in New Jersey. The other two parts of the, the uh, law in New Jersey is that it prohibits giving straws um, to customers without them requesting one. Uh, so today um, we noticed when we went to the jet and I love the jet and we forgot they were in New York and we got a pile of straws on the table. And I was like, oh, we're not in New Jersey. And um, you know, my, my family noticed that as well. So um, it's still a law that needs to be enforced more I think it's more at the education level now and hopefully at the enforcement level soon, but we prohibit the uh, straws uh, because that is one of the items found on our beach cleanups a lot in, in communities. We also, um, time, okay. Oh, so you said the clock is wrong, okay. We also prohibit the styrofoam, um, handing out styrofoam in our, um, from restaurants um, because styrofoam is a form of plastic. 
So during our beach cleanups over the years, we've removed a lot of this debris, but by way of being citizen scientists, we have um, a, a data card with about 100 items that every item that's picked up by volunteers gets written down. And so they were able to track over the years, over the uh, years of the beach cleanup, what was found and in what amount and in what place, because we generally have the same 70 locations in the spring and fall. Um, and the next one's coming up on Octo October 22nd. And for three hours, people come and do a cleanup, write it down and be part of a legacy of information that has been used to get federal um, and state laws uh, to prohibit, to prevent um, plastic litter from being a problem in our waters. So over 7.8 million items have been picked up by 157,000 volunteers over the time of the cleanups. Um, and we are able to get valuable information and, and um, about the debris um, that has led to those laws. So just as an example, we have um, given, you can get statistics from our cleanups, 82% uh, of the uh, items or plastic, if you include foam plastic, it's more than um, almost, it's almost, it's about 90%. Uh, so we have a lot of plastic debris out there in large amounts in various size, shapes and forms, but we have other debris as well, but plastic is overwhelming the, what we are finding on our beaches, which provides the evidence for the laws that we need. Um, we used to have something called the dirty dozen, the top 12 things that are found on our beaches. And over time, things change. Um, product, different products are, are made and manufactured or retired. So we used to have pull tabs from um, cans that are um, was, were always found on our beaches, like the pull tab. Now you have like the little um, top that you wiggle back and forth. But we also used to have cigarette butts as the number one item found on our beaches. Um, it has slipped a bit. Um, we've had some non-smoking. Uh, so we had some smoking bans in place in some communities. Um, and uh, also now everyone seems to be, or a lot of people are switching to e-cigarettes. Then we had to add that to our card, the little cartridges and the materials that come from e-cigarette waste. Uh, so that's what we're finding on our beaches. So we have to adapt to the products that are being made and also being uh, disposed in our, um, uh, or discarded and littered. We use buckets to reduce the plastic bags we use when we collect our, our garbage. So these, this is our, our buckets, uh, happy bucket holders for our beach cleanup at Sandy Hook. Um, some things that are next, we need to enforce the law and promote implementation. But I know years ago, we used to talk about the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, but we also need to refuse the plastic. No, thank you, I don't need a bag, or even the paper. No, thank you, I don't need a bag. Refill the items that you have make use, use of them over and over again. I was happy to see some refill um, uh, uh, stations um, along the, the throughway or uh, the highway, you know, at the rest stops, you know, bringing your reusable water bottle. Recycled content legislation, New Jersey has passed that. So we uh, require, it's not in, in, um, not in effect yet, but a certain percentage of uh, uh, recycled material made in packaging. So it's not using virgin, fossil fuels, it's reusing and making a circular market for our recycling. That's everything's getting in the recycling bill. Well, is it being recycled? Not really. So we could help that by using that material into, and making it to other things. Um, and also there's a false solution being uh, put out there by um, people that are promoting plastic use is something called chemical and advanced recycling. It's essentially plastic burning. It's an incineration, gasification, paralysis, whatever you're gonna call it, it's burning plastic waste. And that in itself has its own impacts uh, for air, air, land, and it's just perpetuating the production of plastic. And uh, New York is also uh, has a EPR bill or extended producer responsibility uh, rule, and New Jersey is working on one. It puts the burden on the manufacturers of the plastics to figure out the whole life cycle of the plastics instead of making the consumers be the person, I need to recycle this, I need to put in recycling, um, and I need to figure out, and municipalities need to figure out how to get the recycling from here to the facility. It puts the burden on the manufacturers um, by making them pay for it and plan for it since they're the ones putting it out there. So that's something that's next on the agenda for most uh, states and um, organizations working on plastics issues. Um, and then also, as, as in some, we have ways to reduce um, and avoid plastics now. This just sums up a lot of my talking points. It's harmful to marine life, it's harmful to public health. Um, it's perpetuating the climate change issues problems. Um, and I, I, this little cartoon, it's sad, but uh, I feel like I live the life with you know, picky eaters in my family. 
um, and me and myself as well. Um, but you know, plastics are really being served up to our animals, um, not by choice, they think it's food. Um, and it's something that was created by people and it needs to be solved by people and each and every one of us. So with that, I'll take some questions. I know there's a class after here, but I wanna thank Alfred University and Dr. Lukey for bringing me here today um, and inviting me back to speak to all of you. I, I hope I inspired you to think about your everyday um, practices in terms of plastic and your impact on, on life and the environment. I hope you think about getting involved in nonprofits, even just to get a taste of it, to understand how things go and how things work and how people can make change. Um, I know there's a class after this, so I'm happy to take questions now until we can have to skedaddle um, and I'm happy to take some um, questions outside um, as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, Fred. Yes, uh, Fred. Yes. And I don't see where in that chain it could end up in the environment. Now, I understand it's not the solution long term. But all that plastic on the beach, even if I live in New Jersey and I put it in the it will go in the next There's something else happening that's leading to this. And is it to really us as consumers that are responsible? We are in the sense of the pie, it's just Sure, the question for those on Zoom was, um, is, is all of that, I mean, in the summary, is all of the material finding on our beaches, is that really from consumers? And where is a waste stream break up where um, this material is really, that amount is getting out there? Um, and I would say that, unfortunately, if you, drive or go visit these areas, I'm pretty sure you'll find garbage on the streets and garbage in communities. And that does wash with every rainstorm into our, into our waterways and go, does not get filtered. Um, there's no gate, you know, filtering or screens on the ends of um, most pipelines uh, that go into our waterways. So with every rainstorm, with all those millions of people dropping one cigarette butt or one straw or one cup, it all adds up and all comes right into our waterways. And it could be there for quite some time. Um, you've all heard of the Pacific garbage patch, I'm sure. There's one probably in every sea and ocean, just the way the currents are. But the idea is that that, that amount of debris is not gonna get caught and collected. Um, there are you know, obviously some organizations or um, businesses that are developing boats and skimmer boats and things like that. There are things like that in place in New York Harbor. There's a skimmer boat that's supposed to collect a lot of these mats of floating debris into our ocean before it gets out there. Whether the program is, you know, being efficient and and, and operational all the time and when it needs to be, it's, it's um, you know, also something to be uh, mindful of. Um, it is is well. Think about the plastics that we all have in our daily life. Just go to the store. Just take a look at the vegetable and produce aisle. Everything is wrapped in plastic. Um, so that also, so that goes into the waste you're talking about consumers. So say you do put it in the garbage. You said it's going to go to the landfill around here. It's Angelica, is that where it is? So the landfills are filling up. There's only so much space. And if you're from New Jersey, you could see that we, we do have a lot of open spaces. Believe it or not, take a ride. We have a lot of farmland, a lot of open spaces, but we have a lot of areas. Um, that all the garbage has to go somewhere and it's going to the landfill. The landfills are being filled up. The landfills are having their own leaking problems. Think about the process of getting the garbage from your house to the landfill. You're putting it out in bins. The wind blows and it's knocked over or it comes out of the truck or the truck, you know, they do their best to get it in the truck. It doesn't always get there. You have leakage from a garbage truck driving down the road. Um, there's so many different sources and even just a little from each source is adding up. And as I said, we have a lot of plastics out there. So generally we will have a lot of plastics to try to get rid of. Um, we have, you know, recycling is a solution. Has it been the most effective and the, the best? Is it run the best way? No, I think there's definitely improvement. Um, so we could 
capture that plastic and make use of it through the recycled content. But we also have a problem of what are we doing with the stuff? What are, why don't we reduce the plastics that we're making so we don't have that, the problem of what to do with it? Um, so again, so landfills have their own, um, own problems in terms of the, the rules and regulations for capping it and also for making sure that um, if you think about what goes in the landfill, you could have something that's biodegradable and it's going in the landfill, it's still going to be there because there's no sunlight, there's the conditions are not the way to break it down. Um, so we're just filling up our landfills with this material instead of reducing it and, um, and finding other ways to, to deal with it. Any other questions? Oh, the front? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Are there any companies, any companies that do not use plastic and, and are making a public uh, case for their product, therefore? Absolutely. There, um, I was just recently at a conference um, uh, arranged by Beyond Plastics, which um, I don't know if you know about. They're led by an organization. Um, led by a leader who used to work, who used to be an EPA administrator. Um, and I was just at a conference with them and they had a couple of companies that are showing their cleaning products um, that are made of glass. So one glass bottle you get, and then you get a powder um, to mix in with water. Because if you think about the detergents and the cleaners, most of it is, is water in the solution. So we're actually paying for the weight of water with a little cleaner, cleaner in it to be shipped all over the place. Whereas you could pay for a shipment of one empty bottle with a little packet of powder for the cleaners. And then all you have to do is get the packets of cleaners mailed to you or at the store. Um, so you're just, you're not paying for the uh, cost of shipping all this heavy stuff through the system using fossil fuels for the trucks that need to bring these products. So there are companies that are listening, are seeing that uh, plastics are harmful to your health. So as you're consuming things from plastics and, and the plastics leaching into things when you heat them in the microwave and so forth, um, there are companies that are innovating and coming up with those glass solutions and those other solutions um, or things made out of recycled material. So um, I think, you know, we've come a long way. There's still a long way to go, um, but I think it comes to innovation and um, the young bright minds that are in our, in our colleges today to come up with some sound solutions um, to, to make that switch easy. Man. Um, my question is, I, I actually have a couple of thoughts, but there's no plastic at all. Um, are there different push for incentives for these young companies to be to break through this? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Luann asked um, if there's any incentives for companies to make these better products that are made of glass and not plastic. I'm, I'm not, I'm not prepared to. I don't know the ins and outs of the business models for 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 those companies, but I know that they were, you know, they're anxious to be the solution and be front for, forward facing, so that people that are learning about the impacts. So I think public pressure and public um, consumer choice is the desire and the driver for that. Um, and I know the companies that were speaking to us on that day were just looking to show their products and say, listen, this is really easy. It's an easy switch. And if we can do it, uh, then we know that other uh, companies can do it. And that brings the competition, Luann. So there's gonna be other products that are gonna be seeing, okay, this is, this is, a, oh, this is the right way to go, or this, is, this business is being very successful. Um, you know, just as an example, yesterday in, our, in the hearing for the plastic bags, um, you know, plastic, the, the paper bags are actually not included in the original law for banning, you're banning paper uh, plastic bags, but the food stores were actually the one that said, we don't want the paper bags either because they're expensive. And also there is an environmental footprint, you know, trees and um, the production of them. But so this company has come up with this kiosk where you, you know, pay to get your bags, you use them, you bring them back within 30 days and you get your, you get, um, your money back. Um, and then they, clean, they take them, they clean and sanitize them in their facility. They also have um, the, the actual product is, um, you can take it apart. If there's a rip, they, can, they will stitch it and they will fix it. So you're not making a whole other new bag. 
um, but this is innovation. So the company said, I want to tell everyone about this. We, we want to tell everyone because we want competitors. We want the solutions to be out there for people to use. Um, and, and New Jersey is a great place because we banned both and everybody needs to bring their bags. Um, so um, I don't know about incentives, but I think public choice and um, public pressure is, is helpful. Wait, wait, okay. I'm happy to talk after, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone online.